We begin in 1815. The Napoleonic Wars have, after two decades, come to a close. But despite the arrangements made at the Congress of Vienna, the shadow of the French Revolution and Napoleon's conquests linger over Europe. The effects of nationalism are exponentially increasing, and the continent is bound for new and rather unwelcome change. Nations are simultaneously pulled apart and drawn together again by common goals and the culture of regional peoples, now against the ruling monarchies that are hellbent on maintaining their total authority. In 1848, these sentiments come to a head and explode into a continent-wide revolution against ruling monarchies, oppressive regimes, and foreign powers. In Germany, a united sense of identity drives a movement for unification under a constitutional monarchy. In the Austrian Empire, German, Hungarian, and Italian nationalists rise up against the state, advocating for either independence, autonomy, or liberal reform. During these uprisings, as we look to France, after a series of protests against French ministers and upper-class authority, the monarchy falls, and on February 24th, the Second Republic was proclaimed. The nationalist fervor spread, encompassing the disunited states of Germany and its peoples. The black, red, and gold German tricolor is flown throughout the small German kingdoms. The monarchs are forced to grant significant concessions to the masses of protesters marching through the streets of their major cities. The liberal endeavor of a unified Germany is discussed at the first and short-lived National Assembly held in Frankfurt, as the Constitution is drafted, and there, a further discussion of the German question. The query of whether Prussia or Austria will dominate a future German state. Prussia, the largest of the German kingdoms, is at first spared by the developments arising in the heartland of Germany. However, protesters quickly rise in the capital city of Berlin, and conflict erupts between them and the soldiers stationed in the city. A year later, in 1849, the National Assembly in Frankfurt has come to an agreement, proposing a new constitution for a united German state, led by an emperor. The man asked to take this position is none other than Prussian King Wilhelm. This offer is declined by the king, who found it a disgrace to his image and royal lineage to accept a crown handed by the peasantry and their revolution from the gutter. Prussia wanted Germany united by their own hand, through proficiency and victory, not through the uncivilized protest and objection of the middle classes. While this event mostly killed the possibility of a united constitutional German empire, new uprisings across Germany, most importantly in Dresden, still call for the establishment of the constitution. These revolutionaries are then put down by the local military garrisons with the assistance from the Prussian military, who, amongst all, most greatly desire an end to these insurgencies against the status quo. After a series of conflicts throughout the continent, most of these uprisings are crushed by the conservative ruling classes, but the end of these protests have not left Europe without the side effects of their actions. The movements for German and Italian unification had failed, but they had made large strides towards reform across the continent. A movement for change is growing, and soon, it would succeed. But to find this change, we must fast forward. Germany would soon be united, but not by the hand of the people, but by the prowess of the Prussian kingdom. The people wanted change, it was coming, but not in the way that anyone expected. The Prussians wanted reform, on their own terms, not by the insignificant working classes of the nation, but by the will of the state and its authority. In 1862, the Prussians began a massive program of modernization that would forever shape its history. King Wilhelm I did not want political reform, but rather a modernization of the state through its might and power, and unification by the ability of Prussia and its constituents. The nation and its liberal politicians did not want such militaristic and authoritarian action to be taken. So in order to achieve his dream of unity and power, King Wilhelm appointed a man who had changed the world, arguably the greatest and most renowned statesman of modern history one Otto von Bismarck. In the words of Bismarck himself, it is not by speeches and majority decisions that the great questions of the day be decided, but by iron and blood. And this is exactly what he wanted to do, in the name of Prussia and its glory. Bismarck is appointed to the position of Prime Minister in 1862, with two missions, ensure the end of parliamentary interference upon the will of the king, and unify the German peoples. Bismarck appeared in Parliament, giving one of the most renowned and powerful speeches in history, with the title taking reference to the speech itself and its most famous line, Iron and Blood. This militaristic statement was met with uproar from the rather liberal Parliament, which opposed the army reforms proposed. The bounds of the liberal German Confederation, born of a poor attempt at restoring unity and stability, confined the will and aspirations of the growing Prussian kingdom. But this confederation is just what Bismarck needed to secure war justifications to ensure Prussian-led German unification. You see, during the 1848 revolutions, the Kingdom of Denmark defeated Prussia during the First Schleswig War, and relations had never really healed since then. 
Tensions arose once again due to the Danish November Constitution, which was pushed through by Danish nationalists in 1863. The Constitution violated the London Protocol due to its major impacts upon the ethnic German minorities living in Schleswig-Holstein duchies. As a result, conflict quickly erupts in 1864. Bismarck seizes this opportunity by calling the Confederation to war with Denmark, swiftly defeating and humiliating them, despite a desperate last stand by the Danes at the island of Als. The Treaty of Vienna in October of the same year saw the Danish cession of the duchies of Schleswig, Holstein, and Saxe-Lauenburg to a separate but coordinated occupation by Prussia and Austria. Bismarck, however, is left dissatisfied by this peace, but within it saw an opportunity to once and for all settle the German question. Conflict soon arises over the future of Schleswig and Holstein as Austria wants to unite the two occupation zones into a single independent entity while Prussia wishes to either ensure its influence over Schleswig and Holstein, or to annex the duchies outright. To ensure their victory, Prussia sends a secret treaty to the recently unified Italian kingdom, which states that in the event of a war, Italy would join Prussia against Austria in return for ethnically Italian lands held by the Austrians, specifically the region of Venetia, a territory long cherished by the Austrians for strategic importance and it being the last remaining Italian territory for the empire. It remained as a pitiful remnant of its once grand authority the Holy Roman Empire held over the Italian peninsula. The Italians were eager for another war against the Austrians, as they had technically defeated them in the Second Italian War of Independence in 1859. However, the French, Italian allies, did the important fighting and were the only reason the Sardinians won. Without French support, Austria would have crushed the Italians. As a result, Sardinia took Lombardy from Austria and formed the Kingdom of Italy in 1861. Now, back to 1863. Bismarck is preparing Prussia for a war, and this does not go unnoticed by his fellow statesmen and political figures of Europe. The liberals, keen on preventing a conservative and militaristic Prussia from securing its hold over a future Germany, side with Austria because it had recently undergone major political reforms. On February 26, 1861, Austria adopted the February Patent as the Imperial Constitution, creating a House of Lords and a House of Deputies to give the peoples of the Empire representation. Additionally, the Austrians lacked the expansionist ambitions that pose a major threat to liberal reform in Europe. The wars that are coming are not ones by the will of the people, but orchestrated by a select few statesmen, hellbound on attaining further power and authority. Bismarck's manipulation is both masterful and meticulous, driving Austria right into his trap, ensuring that his war is quote-unquote justified. He first accuses Austria of violating their occupation treaty, then to evaluate and review the situation, Austria goes to the German Confederation for arbitration and clarification, which is then a legitimate violation of the Treaty of Vienna, leading to a now valid war justification for Prussia. The Prussians then seize the Austrian-occupied Holstein, and then propose a motion to remove Austria from the Confederation entirely. This sparks war, and just as Bismarck has planned, conflict begins, and his conviction in Prussia's military power facilitated his confidence. The Austro-Prussian War has begun, as German brothers fight in an ethnic civil war for superiority that would decide the fate of the modern Germany. During this war, the Prussians fight alongside many of the small northern Protestant German states and later Italy, while the Austrians fight mostly have the southern Catholic German states and the Confederation. Prussia's military high command, while less experienced on the actual battlefield, has a stockpile of more modern weaponry and much more coordinated and organized command structure while Austria, on the other hand, had a rather outdated military system, but has much more experienced generals and officers, while both sides relying on basic inexperienced conscripts. Another leading challenge for Austria was its multi-ethnic empire. Conscripts can't solely be from German-speaking territories, but rather the army, like the empire itself, is made up of many different languages and peoples who will either have troubles communicating with the rest of the army, or will lack loyalty necessary to sustain a conflict. This highlights many of the conflicts Austria faced and why it was so desperate to stay out of a conflict with Prussia. It is also important to note that this is the first major use of the needle gun, a new type of breech-loading firearm that could shoot prepared cartridges that included gunpowder and the bullet within a small little container, then using a needle to poke the cartridge, firing the bullet. The war begins with fierce fighting, beginning in Hanover and Bohemia, with both sides facing issues in communication due to lack of rations. The Prussians did not have a decisive victory in the Northern Front, but due to a Bavarian withdrawal and the division of the Confederation forces in the region, the Prussians managed to sweep through, taking the key and historic city of Frankfurt as Bavarians retreat to a defensive position in their own territory. Prussia then seized successes in Bohemia due to its superior weaponry, leading to the famous Battle of Koniggratz in early July that saw heavy casualties on both sides, but still a major Prussian victory. As we turn to the south, Italy maintains its commitment and on June 19th, 
joined the conflict, opening a second southern front for the Austrians. A battle immediately begins on the border city of Custoza, that raged on for an entire day, with both sides trading key positions on the battlefield and making numerous mistakes that could have turned the tide of the battle. By the end of the day, the Italians were forced to retreat, but despite their losses in the battle, they took around 20,000 fewer casualties and showed that they had been underestimated by the Austrian high command. Italy then makes a successful push at the city of Garda, but it is stopped once news is heard of the beginning of peace settlements. The war officially comes to an end on July 26, with the conflict only lasting seven weeks as an explicit and decisive Prussian victory. The treaties of Prague and Vienna are signed, and rather than imposing harsh punishments and humiliation upon the Austrian Empire, Bismarck insists that the peace is to be mild without any harsh penalties so as not to isolate Austria from Prussia as a future ally. Even going as far as threatening to resign with his requests are not met by King Wilhelm. The king is forced to concede after his son pressures him to accept Bismarck's proposal, seeing the value in an Austrian ally. As a result, Austria simply had to pay financial reparations to Prussia, cede Venezia to Italy, and dissolve the German Confederation in favor of one led by Prussia. With this peace, Prussia annexed many northern German states allied with Austria, such as Hanover, Schleswig-Holstein, and Frankfurt, with Prussia also forcing its influence on the southern German states in preparation for full unification. But to do this, Bismarck had one last cunning plan, with one goal, and all he had to do was wait for his opportunity. In July of 1870, he got precisely what he needed. You see, during this time, the Spanish throne had been left vacant and was offered to Prince Leopold Hohenzollern Sigmaringen, a member of the Swabian branch of the Hohenzollern royal family, the same dynasty that ruled the Prussian kingdom. Once news reached France that Prince Leopold actually accepted the offer, the public was in outrage at the prospect of having the same aggressive royal families rule two countries neighboring France. Obviously not wanting to fight on two massive fronts in the event of a war, leading to many major political figures in France denouncing Leopold's decision and calling upon King Wilhelm to prevent him from taking power. Agenor de Gramont, French Minister of Foreign Affairs, made a powerful speech about the dangers of Hohenzollern leadership in Spain. Then, sending Count Vincent Benedetti as an ambassador to speak with King Wilhelm in the city of Bad Ems, Benedetti requested the king negate Prince Leopold's claim to the Spanish throne and force him to decline the offer. King Wilhelm is furious that he has to manage such a crisis, but does ask Prince Leopold's father to refuse the Spanish throne on behalf of his son, which he obliges to. Despite this, Foreign Minister Grimaud is still dissatisfied and sees a future possibility of a Hohenzollern in Spain, prompting him to send Benedetti to King Wilhelm once again, to have him announce and assert that no member of the Hohenzollern dynasty will ever again lay claim to the Spanish throne. King Wilhelm quickly refuses to make such a statement, having the information of this altercation relayed to Bismarck famously by telegram. Receiving this message, Bismarck alters the telegram to make it appear that King Wilhelm had greatly disrespected Benedetti during their confrontation, sending this tampered version of the dispatch to diplomats, foreign embassies, and to the media by the evening of July 13th. The next day, the news of the telegram reaches France and the people are outraged by this artificial and altered act of contempt by King Wilhelm. So, as to resolve the increasingly precarious and hostile situation, it is decided that a council be formed to resolve the crisis. Unfortunately, however, the French Minister of War, Emon Le Boeuf, convinced French Emperor Napoleon III to mobilize the army and prepare for war against Prussia, rather than peacefully resolving the situation. The following day, after a debate over the matter within Parliament, the government voted to formally declare war against Prussia, a patriotic sentiment that has already begun the day before due to the altered Ems dispatch reading France on Bastille Day sweeps across the nation as men prepare for a valiant and noble war against Prussia, wishing to defeat the growing kingdom and secure their influence in Europe. Soldiers march through the streets leading patriotic parades as bands play the French national anthem as a nation prepares for a war that will define modern history. In Prussia, a similar sensation is seen as soldiers and working men alike parade through the streets, singing songs and celebrating both their king and Otto von Bismarck. The Prussians then mobilized their army in conjunction with other German states such as Bavaria, Hessen, Baden, and Württemberg. War then begins as the North German Confederation joins together against France, as the Second French Empire will stand alone on the battlefield, without allies or large military capability against an enemy hellbent on French humiliation and German expansion. In the Prussian camp, mobilization is proceeding in an efficient and timely manner due to the use of faster trains and greater military organization, with Prussian forces arriving at the front lines a mere two weeks after the government's ordered mobilization. The Confederation Army is made up of a combination of armies from each of the participating German states, all commanded under Prussian leadership, specifically all under the larger command of Prince Frederick Wilhelm and Field Marshal Helmuth von Moltke the Elder, leading the 1st and 2nd German armies. 
with this combined army totaling approximately 520,000 men. In France, mobilization has gone disastrously, with much of the Imperial Army having to travel across the country to reach the front lines, leading to major delays and disorganization among troops and complete chaos in concentration points, with soldiers who are near the front lines being forced to deploy with either minimal training, without full strength and organization, or simply departing before receiving all necessary equipment. Overall, it is a complete disaster that would define the French performance in the conflict. Despite this, there is a confidence among the French High Command due to their approach of having pre-stockpiled supply depots near front lines as to ensure efficient and rapid deployment of weapons and other supplies. This plan, although initially deemed rather good, it remains unknown to many that corrupt officials diverted the allocated funds for filling the depots with supplies. Instead, they selfishly appropriated the money for personal gain. This misappropriation has led to another disastrous outcome for the French. The military high command sends urgent messages back to the capital to mend the situation. But by this point, it has become too late. There are serious shortages of weapons, food, ammunition, uniforms, and general equipment that cannot be supplied. As war has already broken out, and any attempt to supply these soldiers as they get mowed down by the superior German infantry would simply be in vain, as the French army is still being outnumbered nearly 2 to 1, having only 300,000 men. But now, war has begun, so let's see how the conflict will unfold in the coming battles. The war begins, and the French quickly make a military breakthrough into the city of Saarbrücken, but they soon unnecessarily retreat and abandon the city, likely in fear that they would soon be ambushed, as without sufficient supplies they would not be able to launch a major offensive, as they had planned. The Germans, realizing the French have no ability to perform their large assault across the border, start engaging the French for key cities on the French side of the border, beginning at the key railway hub city of Wissembourg, which the Germans take in less than a day securing a major point that will be used to supply and transport more soldiers to the front line to perform a quick and rapid assault on the French lines. Despite this victory, the Germans suffered heavy losses due to superior firing range of French rifles, leading to similar results in for each coming battle. The French would take defensive positions on territory that favored their superior range, causing the Germans to have to attack and rush through open enemy terrain to even get into range, because while the German rifles were superior at the effective range, they would lose nearly 50% of their men just to get to that point creating a cycle of near-suicidal German attacks, but at a large heavy price that would define German military reputation during this conflict. The end of the most organized French resistance came at the Battle of Sedan, during which the entire city was surrounded, leading to the capture of over 100,000 French soldiers, and even Emperor Napoleon III himself. This caused a massive uprising in Paris that deposed the Emperor and installed the Third French Republic. The combined German armies then began sweeping across the country and laid siege to Paris, during this time, on January 18, 1871, in the Hall of Mirrors in the Royal Palace of Versailles, the German Empire is proclaimed a nation that would finally, after a millennia, truly unite all the German people with the Prussian king, Wilhelm I, as its emperor. Paris would fall soon after, on January 28, despite fierce civilian resistance, leading to the new president, Adolf Thiers, being forced to negotiate with the new German Empire. An armistice is signed in February, during which the Socialist French Revolution aka the French Commune, rose up in Paris, but it is soon crushed by the new government. Then, on May 18th, the Treaty of Frankfurt is signed leading to the German occupation of much of northern France, a large sum of war reparations, and most importantly, the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine, a French territory with a sizable German minority, with the desire for the return of this territory leading to French revenge up to World War I, and its decision to harshly punish Germany at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Germany would become a major world power with the massive industrial and military capacity fueled by its growing population that would define its politics and foreign policy for the coming decades. The Germans then began to colonize, organizing the Berlin Conference in 1884 to set rules for colonization and create trade regulations, as well as establishing spheres of influence and claim territories for those invited to the conference. The Germans would take territory in these modern-day nations in Africa. In 1888, Emperor Wilhelm I died at the age of 90, followed by his son, Emperor Friedrich III, who only reigned for 99 days, dying of throat cancer, leading to his son, Wilhelm II, taking the throne at the age of 29 on June 15, 1888. Unlike his grandfather, Wilhelm II was determined to actually rule Germany, which put him in immediate competition with Bismarck, who clung on to his power and believed that he could manipulate and control his young Kaiser. While Bismarck was instrumental in unifying Germany, he had classical liberals, socialists, and Catholics used as scapegoats to hold on to his power, ingraining division into the very essence of German culture, 
and he was staunchly against the minor liberal reforms that Wilhelm believed in, such as labor unions and better workers' rights. Wilhelm II, always eager to prove himself, finally removed Bismarck from power on March 20, 1890, after being undermined by the Iron Chancellor for the previous two years. Wilhelm II had new plans for the German Empire, and was ready for his moment in the sun. German unification is an event that changed history, and its importance must not be understated. A nation now finally born out of iron and blood. If you want to see a video on the German Empire or any other topics, please let me know in the comment section. If you're interested in my maps, sources, and more, please consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a channel member. Please leave a like and subscribe as it helps immensely. Until next time, fellow history enthusiasts, goodbye.